Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mid-South Sewing is an authorized brother dealer and repairs all brands of machines. Mid-South Sewing, known for their many fabrics, classes, and individual instructions. Classes on sewing and embroidery machines, software, sergers, and quilting. Mid-South Sewing, Knoxville and Murfreesboro. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com. And by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations KnoxvilleFlowerPot.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on this edition of Tennessee Life, a talent for playing the piano grew into a love of preserving the instruments for this Friendsville man. We visit the Antique Piano Shop, where pianos from Tennessee and some famous ones from around the world get restored key by key. So many of our customers have their pianos restored so that they can preserve the memories of their grandmothers, great-grandmothers. They have them restored so that their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can continue to play the pianos that their ancestors knew. When Linda Boucher moved to Tennessee, she brought a love for crocheting and a whole lot of fabric. Watch how she turns those scraps into rugs and more. <laughs> you know, it just puts me in another world because I like doing it and I don't plan any of my pieces. They just evolve. And how much do you know about our state's first first lady? We talked with author Dr. Nancy McEntee about her book on Malsey Blunt. I guess I wrote it because I was curious and I was frustrated. I live in Blunt County and every day I would pass Mary Blunt Elementary School. And I wondered who she was because I had just recently moved from Monroe to Blunt County. And nobody really gave me a good answer. Those stories next on Tennessee Life. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Tennessee Life. I'm Vicki Lawson. For many people, a piano isn't just an instrument. It's a memory of the loved ones who used to play it. Michael Stennett showed amazing musical abilities at a young age but his love for playing the piano turned into a passion for restoring them. Today, his shop in Friendsville is restoring pianos from around the world and right here in Tennessee. We take you inside the antique piano shop. I always believed that there was real value in what we were doing. I believe that there is real value in preserving our heritage. There's real value in remembering the loved ones that are attached to these pianos. And as a pianist myself, the sound of these instruments is so much different, so much richer than what you get in the new import pianos, the disposable pianos. The wood in these pianos was growing when the Indians were running around. The virgin forests, they're all gone. You can't get that anymore. My name is Michael Stennett, and I'm the founder of the Antique Piano Shop. I've been working on pianos all my life, but I established this company in 2008. We're in Friendsville, Tennessee. I grew up just down the street from here, and when I was three years old, I had been to Bible school at the little church across the street from our shop here, and we sang Jesus Loves Me. And that night when I got home, I walked up to the old piano that we had sitting in the corner and I started playing Jesus Loves Me. And of course, I don't remember this. I was only three years old, but this is the story that was told to me by my mom and my dad. Apparently my mom was in the house by herself with me. I started playing the piano and she thought someone else was in the house and she came running in there and I was playing Jesus Loves Me on the piano. And after that, I realized that I was able to play anything that I heard. And to this day, I can hear a piece of music and I can reproduce it. By the time I was in junior high school, I was taking college level music courses at a local college here and was going to be a concert pianist. That was my life's ambition. 
and ended up uh, tuning and repairing pianos in high school and never had a real job. <laughs> We happened to have an old piano sitting in the corner that my older sister had taken lessons on. and I think my mom said they'd pay $25 for it from one of our neighbors. And I quickly outgrew that piano. It needed a lot of work. Uh, so we got us another piano. By the time I was in high school, I was tuning it myself. The second piano that my parents got for me also needed quite a bit of work. And so I actually fixed it with Tinker Toys. I tuned it, learned how to tune it, fixed the broken hammers and notes with Tinker Toys, and then sold that piano for $150. I bought a swatch and I bought another piano. <laughs> I was so proud of that swatch. The first time I had a customer tear up with joy seeing what I had done, I knew that that's what I needed to do. And that's what gave me the drive and the passion to persevere and to grow the company. I believe that today's society is looking for something to come back full circle. And the piano in the home was such an important part of American society. Socially, it was our music, it was our entertainment. Everyone gathered around the piano. So many of our customers have their pianos restored so that they can preserve the memories of their grandmothers, great-grandmothers. They have them restored so that their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can continue to play the pianos that their ancestors knew. And so it's almost as if they have souls of these people that we love still in them. It's such an incredible amount of gratification that we get seeing people respond to the work that we do. That's what's important. Collectively, it's about 400 to 600 hours to restore a piano. Uh, so the average restoration takes us about a year to a year and a half. are genuine real ivory keys and the black keys, so you, this is what it looks like in the process. Right. There's really not anybody else doing what we're doing. A lot of the pianos that we restore are one of a kind, and we have to manufacture obscure parts, and so we're doing the kind of work that's not being done anywhere else in the world. The restoration project that I'm most proud of are the pianos that we restored for the Grand Old Opry after the floods of 2010. There were three Steinway pianos, two large concert grands and one upright that were in the Ryman Auditorium. And when the floods came, the pianos floated out into the parking lot. That's how bad it was. They were submerged in water for a day or so and were found on their tops. All the part, the legs, the lids, all of that floated away. One was from the 1920s when the Grand Ole Opry or the Ryman first opened. The other one was from just after World War II. And then the third one was from 1906, and they're not sure how it got to the Opry. But the 1906 model, we have a video of uh, President Nixon playing that piano the last year he was in office at the Grand Ole Opry. So all three pianos were destroyed in the floods. No one would, was willing to restore them. They were covered in mold, they'd been saturated, and really they were too far gone. But because of their historical provenance, the Grand Ole Opry wanted these pianos restored. So we said we would do it. It took us almost three years to do it, and we did it. And they were restored to perfection. They turned out just like brand new pianos. And we were so proud. The piano behind me is a John Broadwood Grand that was built in 1877, and we acquired it from a family who had been the heirs of royalty in Hawaii. And after we purchased it, the family found documentation that they provided to us showing that the piano had been in Buckingham Palace in the Queen's private apartments in the 1950s. It was hard to believe. I had to see the paperwork before I believed it. And lo and behold, we have the paperwork from the Lord Chamberlain's office. So this is definitely a royal piano behind me here. Some of the stories with these pianos are fantastic. That piano is from the teens and it is a, it's a Kanabi that was built in Baltimore. And back then, a customer would pick a piano they liked the sound of at the Kanabi factory, and then they would have their art department do a customization of the piano to either decorate it with carvings or with gilding or with painting. When we got the piano, the lady that we purchased it from thought that it was obscene because it has some uh, topless ladies. Renaissance painting, what do you expect? So she thought it was vulgar, so she took a paintbrush to it and painted the piano black so that it wouldn't be something she had to be ashamed of to have in her house. We tried to remove the black and save the painting and the painting had been so terribly destroyed that our artist had to reproduce all of it. It's an exact uh, depiction of how it would have been when it was brand new. 
Although we love the glitz and glamour of dealing with the movie stars and the millionaires, it's the everyday people who sacrifice to keep their families' memories alive through restoring their pianos. Those are the ones that give us the greatest amount of gratification. I always play the pianos when they're finished and make sure that everything's good, the regulating, the tuning, that sort of thing. Make sure that they feel the way they're supposed to feel. So an important part of what we do is make sure the piano feels and plays like it's supposed to because you can take a piano that's 100 years old, restore it to modern specs, and it will be too heavy and unpleasant to play. Where if you restore it to the appropriate specs for 1890, it'll play like a new piano like it, like it was supposed to. I think a good perspective to consider is a recent news article in the New York Times that was entitled, Where Pianos Go to Die. And that article was talking about how uh, one of the large landfills in Staten Island was getting dozens and dozens of pianos daily dumped and destroyed. Those are likely pianos that were traded in to piano stores, people that are moving and just don't realize what they've got. So pianos are dying every day. Uh, and all of this irreplaceable wood, the ivory, uh, this craftsmanship, it's dying with them. I like to consider our facility a place where pianos go to live again. Later on Tennessee Life, you may be familiar with Blunt Mansion as our state's first capital, but what do you know about the first lady who lived here? But next, we found a woman making rugs out of rags. Linda Boucher came to Tennessee for one visit, and she loved it so much she immediately left her northern hometown to live in La Follette. She brought with her a storage room full of fabrics and a longtime love of crocheting. Today, you'll find her turning those rags into old-fashioned, handcrafted rugs. When I'm making these, I'm, I'm in another world. And I'm, I'm thinking about all that stuff. I'm thinking about family and recycling, the waste not, want not type thing. That all goes into making the rugs and a lot of love. I'm Linda Boucher. I'm the sole owner and operator of Southern Rugs. I'm originally from Massachusetts, and we came down here to visit my sister and brother-in-law who moved down here in La Follette. There was something different about it. I wanted to be here. I loved it. And so did my husband, which was a nice thing. <laughs> and we went back to Massachusetts, put our house up for sale, and haven't looked back since. One of my girlfriends from school, probably around the age of 13 or 14, she did crocheting. And I thought it was pretty neat looking for what she accomplished. At that time, it was yarn. She showed me how to do it, and I picked it up. It's probably the way I crochet. I don't know if it's the proper way. I can't read a pattern. I can read it, but I can't figure it out. So it just, it just went from there. I've been an upholsterer for the major portion of my life. And to switch over to this, I guess fabric to fabric, but in a different sense. I've crocheted since I was a young kid, but to crochet with fabric, that was totally different for me. When we came down here in 2007, I had a ton of fabric because I've sewn all my life. Fabric from curtains and bedspreads and things like that. He says, well, I'm going to do something with it. So I kind of looked up on the internet about weaving. And although it was nice and I was going to do it, I ended up looking up crocheting, which I already knew. And it just grew from there. And when I say grew, it became an addiction. I just couldn't stop doing it. I absolutely loved crocheting. It just puts me in another world because I like doing it. And I don't plan any of my pieces. They just evolve. Unless I'm doing something specific in a pattern. I just pick a bunch of colors 
and start. And what am I going to do? A rug, a placemat, a chair pad. That's what's great about this. I can make anything I want to make. Making a rug or a placemat or a hat, it all basically is, is the same. You pick your fabrics, your colors that you want in your piece, whatever you're going to make, and cut them up. I cut it with a rotary cutter, and after I cut it, depending on the length of the fabric, it needs to be sewed into strips. And once I get everything all sewed up with the colors that I want, they're all in baskets, all individually, go sit myself down on the couch. <laughs> and uh, start crocheting. A normal rug like one that you would throw in front of a door, say 36 inches or so, for me that can be done in, in one evening if I really work at it. Basically two days, maybe 20 hours, maybe less than that. The advantage of buying my rugs as opposed to a commercial store would be you can take these and put them in the washer, put them in the dryer, or put them outside and hose them down. Beat them like they used to do years ago and then throw them on the fence, but it's easier doing the washer and dryer nowadays. <laughs> They're reversible and they bring a piece of yesterday into the home. It's handmade. They get to look at it every day and know that somebody took the time and put the love in making the rug. Through the last, I'd say, five years for me, I've noticed people are more getting into buying something that's American-made, handmade, and kind of country folk, mountain folk, and going back to traditions that mom and grandma, and that's a lot of comments I get. Oh, I remember tearing up sheets for my mother, you know, and she'd braid it and things like that, and it brings back a lot of good memories for people when they see something, not specifically my items, but any items that are handmade. I've had people tell me that they've got rugs that are well over 30 and 40 years old. And I believe it, because these are pretty tough. That's all it started out as rugs, until I had like over 100. It bloomed into several different items when I had too many rugs for stock. I think the next thing I did was placemats and then chair pads. And of course, I have to give my sister credit because she'd come down and say, ooh, why don't you try making this? I saw this on TV or I saw this on the book. And one year when I did a, a little mini show, a young lady was doing felt hats, and I said, oh, hats, hmm. Then the hats came in. Those are very popular, and also I have pocketbooks and handbags. I make mini duffels, which are smaller than a duffel bag, which everybody kind of relates to. I make slippers and booties, also beanie hats. I made so many rugs, it's like, okay, now I gotta do something else because it's too many rugs. It's just, what can I do next? You know, always trying to do something different. My curiosity kills me constantly. People say, well, do you mind if I watch you do? Heck no, watch me, learn, and, and pass it on. You know, we might not be the pioneers of yesterday, but it's, it's a beautiful tradition, and it should be carried on and passed on. William Blunt is well known as the governor of the territory that would become Tennessee, but not much was known about his wife, Malsey Granger Blunt, until now. Dr. Nancy McEntee talked with me about her new book and how she researched Tennessee's little-known first First Lady. I guess I wrote it because I was curious and I was frustrated. I live in Blount County and every day I would pass Mary Blount Elementary School. And I wondered who she was because I had just recently moved from Monroe to Blount County and nobody really gave me a good answer. So I ended up going to the Blount Library thinking, oh boy, they'll have the answer. 
They told me a little bit more, but I still was confused. So eventually I ended up at the Blunt Mansion. They were somewhat helpful, but still nobody had the story. So I was just plain curious, and I love research. So um, I just started researching, and I realized there wasn't even a story written totally about this lady. And she was never called Mary while she was alive. She had a mother named Mary. She had a grandmother named Mary and a couple of cousins named Mary. So she, early on, is called Molly. Eventually, the family takes that name, and she becomes Malsey. And so when I see Mary Blunt, I want to run around, correct everybody. History needs to know this lady as Malsey Blunt. To understand Malsey Blunt's story, we need to understand the role her husband played as the governor of the territory that eventually became the state of Tennessee. Uh, 1790, George Washington is looking for a man to come over the mountains uh, to the territory, which he will call south of the river Ohio, to get a better understanding of the Indian problems and to look after the land grants that were being issued to Revolutionary War soldiers. William Blunt had land over the mountains, so he was an obvious choice. So in October of 1790, we have William Blunt coming over the mountains with his half-brother Wiley Blunt to set up shop and to find and establish a more or less a capital in this area. So that meant she was alone a lot, wasn't she? Malsey's story is not a happy one. I present it more as a, she's a tragic figure. She spends a lot of her years alone, left behind, uh, in charge of a plantation with slaves and uh, her children without much help. And there are some unanswered parts of her life that I hope with this uh, book coming out, this research, that somebody eventually will find out more about um, what really happened to her. She was very well known in the Knoxville area, and yet today there is not a surviving portrait, painting, picture, image of Malsey Blunt. There is not a original word she has left behind, not a letter, a journal, or a diary. So. In doing the research, I had to find her through her um, brother-in-law's and her husband's words. How did you go about doing the research? I guess the most useful documents I had were the letters that the Blunt brothers write to each other throughout the marriage of uh, William and Malsey until William's death in 1800. There is also um, Caleb Granger, Malsey's father leaves a, excellent, a really informative will behind. We also have the Annals of Tennessee written by J.G.M. Ramsey. Somewhat helpful, yet I take some of it with a grain of salt. So those were my original documents I had to use. You can still visit Blunt Mansion today, and that's an example of William Blunt wanting to give his wife a beautiful home. Yes and no. When I was doing my research, a member of the board asked me, would you please find out, did Malsey cry for three days when she knew she had to come to the frontier? And I never found out whether or not she did. I know she was very resistant to the idea of coming to the uh, frontier. And so we tend to think, well, William built the house to keep her happy, or did William build the house to impress the people that he would be coming in contact? And I really don't know. I think it's a combination of both. Your passion is in research. How difficult is it to tell a silent story? It took me two years to figure out how to tell her story. Because once again, I had no original documents of hers. So the style of the book is one where each chapter starts out with creative fiction. I took the facts that I, I knew well, and I created a story around that. So the reader would read a chapter and get a feel, maybe for the emotions, a better, clearer understanding of what she was seeing or doing or feeling. And then the last part of the chapter was important to tell it exactly as the history shows it. Another first lady had a part in this book. Tell us about that. Yes, I was honored to work with First Lady Chrissy Haslam. She agreed to write the forward to the book, 
and we even got to meet each other in the Blunt Mansion. We signed copies for each other, so it was quite a privilege. So to me, I look at it as it's, it's bookends for the story. What do you hope people will take away after they read your book? Colonial women's voices are really not heard well. And so anytime we can um, add to the historical uh, understanding of women in general, um, I'm all for it. So this fills in, I think, a pretty big hole of a woman who has been forgotten. We hope you've enjoyed these stories of antique pianos, cozy handmade rugs, and our first First Lady. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you on the next Tennessee Line. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mid South Sewing is an authorized brother dealer and repairs all brands of machines. Mid South Sewing, known for their many fabrics, classes, and individual instructions. Classes on sewing and embroidery machines, software, sergers, and quilting. Mid South Sewing, Knoxville and Murfreesboro. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville next to new knox.com and by the flower pot for over 100 years offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient knoxville locations knoxvilleflowerpot.com and by viewers like you thank you